Donald Trump and his team, they promised that they were going to be filing a big motion, and they did. Today, 27 pages hit the docket. It is a suit, a civil complaint that is demanding that the court appoint somebody for oversight, somebody called a special master. And you can see this here. It is Trump versus the United States. We are going to take a look at this document filed out of the Southern District of Florida. It's 27 pages long. I do intend to read through most of it, but we'll skip over the heavy lifting, some of the legal work there. But before we do, this is something that Trump was talking a lot about over the weekend and on True Social, where you can follow me at Robert Govea. This is what he was posting about on the 19th and so on. He said, when will people realize that the atrocities being perpetrated by the FBI and the DOJ having to do with the raid and break-in of my home, Mar-a-Lago, or after years of other atrocities and unthinkable violations of freedom and the law? This has been going on for years, from the moment I came down the golden escalators in Trump Tower right up until the present. At some point, you have to look at what took place in the past to determine what is going on in the present. Trump says, and nothing has ever happened like that, which is going on in our country right now. The law enforcement of our country has become that of a third world nation, and I do not believe the people will stand for it between fraudulent elections, open borders, inflation, giving our military to the enemy, and so much more. How much are we all expected to take, says Trump. He continues, he says, never in our country's history has there been a time where law enforcement has been so viciously and violently involved in the life and times of politics in our nation. Even in light of the fact that they violated the Russia, Russia, Russia scam, impeachment hoax number one, impeachment hoax number two, the Mueller witch hunt lied many times before Congress and on many occasions put out fraudulent information before the FISA court, they continue. They have no shame. They are destroying our country. And lastly, Trump promised this. He said, a major motion pertaining to the Fourth Amendment will soon be filed concerning the illegal break-in of my home, Mar-a-Lago, right before the ever-important midterm elections. My rights, together with the rights of all Americans, have been violated at a level rarely seen before in our country. Remember, they even violated and even spied on my campaign. The greatest witch hunt in USA history has been going on for six years with no consequences to the scammers. It should not be allowed to continue. And so that's Donald Trump on True Social, and that's over the weekend. And then, boom, Monday morning. We learn this over from the Florida courts. We see this was the court docket and we'll scroll all the way up to the top so we can see this. And of course, you can follow along on this. This is over at courtlistener.com and you can just go and you know sort of follow along these cases. Look this case right up if you want to. There's the number. But you see the last update and the date of the last known filing and the date of the actual filing, August 22nd. Uh oh, what is this? It's a motion for judicial review where the U.S. government is the defendant because the U.S. government <gasps> did something wrong, like they allowed an illegal search to happen. And so when you see what happened, we scroll all the way down and we can see the entries here. Motions to appear, pro hoc vice. These are lawyers who are coming in to appear on the court, several of them filing. We know this name, Evan Corcoran, right? Seen him before. James Trusty, we've heard about him. And then we see some other filings. Case gets assigned to somebody named Judge Eileen M. Cannon. They say the parties are notified that the U.S. Magistrate Judge Reinhardt is available to handle any and all proceedings in the case. If agreed, the parties should complete and file the consent form on our website. So the case right now is with another judge, somebody named Judge Eileen. But they're talking about transferring this puppy back over to Judge Bruce, who is the original judge who signed the warrant. Now you see the complaint, and this is the top of the docket. This is what we are going to read now. Filed by Donald Trump for $402, civil cover sheet, text of the proposed order. Let's take a look at it. Here, filed out of the Southern District of Florida. It is 27 pages long. It is in the matter of the search of Mar-a-Lago, 1100 South Ocean Boulevard. And let's scroll all the way down to the bottom first so that we can see what they're asking for so that we have some context. Okay, we have to know sort of what do they want? What kind of, what, how expensive is this purchase really? 
Here's the conclusion, and this was submitted by Lindsay Halligan and James Trusty. We've already learned about them. We heard about them uh, on prior shows here. They say, okay, this is what Trump wants before we get into the meat and potatoes. They say he, he wants to appoint a special master, okay, somebody who is sort of uh, independent of the corrupt DOJ. And number B, they want to enjoin further review of seized materials by the government until that special master is appointed. So stop the feds from rummaging through the boxes and Melania's underwear. And C, require the government to provide a more detailed receipt for the property, right? Rather than listing this over as just sort of a big uh, list of boxes. What did you take? What's in there? And D, require the government to return any seized item that was not within the scope of the search warrant. Okay, so four things there. We want a special master, a stop of the review until we get a special master, more details from the receipt, and a return of any item that's not within the scope of the search warrant. So four big things there. Now let's see how Trump is assembling this argument. It starts, a motion for judicial oversight and additional relief. President Trump is here and he files this motion, which seeks an order that does four of those things we just covered. Starting here, they say, introduction, politics cannot be allowed to impact the administration of justice. Nice, strong sentence. President Trump is a, the clear front runner in the 2024 Republican presidential primary and in the 2024 general election, should he decide to run. Wow. I think that's true. <laughs> I think it's true. Here, here's his evidence. He says, footnote one, for instance, a June 2022 nationwide poll of voters found that 84% of Republicans would support him if he ran. Trump leads the next potential Republican candidate by 44 points. Iowans for tax relief validate those poll numbers. And Joe Biden's support is in the toilet. Trump leads Biden by 11 points, according to his footnotes. So he says, all right, Judge, beyond that, his endorsement in the 2022 midterm elections has been decisive for Republican candidates. For example, on August 8th, no, he doesn't give us an example here, but he says, given that backdrop, he tells us, on August 8th, in a shockingly aggressive move and with no understanding of the distress that it would cause most Americans, roughly two dozen special agents of the FBI directed by attorneys of the U.S. DOJ, hereby called the government, raided the home of the president, Donald J. Trump. According to the government, the agents seized documents, privileged and or potentially privileged materials and other items, including photos, handwritten notes and even Trump's passports. Footnote two says, on August 15th, one after those items were seized, the government acknowledged the seized materials did include the passports belonging to Trump. Recognizing the passports were not validly seized, the government notified counsel for Trump so that they could be retrieved. They say all that was taken outside the lawful reach of an already overbroad warrant. President Trump writes his counsel like all citizens, is protected by the Fourth Amendment to the United States and property seized in violation of his constitutional rights must be returned. Law enforcement, they say, is a shield that protects Americans. It cannot be used as a weapon for political purposes. Therefore, we seek judicial assistance in the aftermath of an unprecedented and unnecessary raid on Trump's home at Mar-a-Lago in Florida. From the first moment the government informed Trump through counsel that a search was underway, he demanded transparency. Trump asked the government the questions that any American citizen would ask under the circumstances. Namely, one, why raid my home with a platoon of federal agents when I have voluntarily cooperated with your every request? And what are you trying to hide from the public, given that you requested that I turn off all home security cameras and even refused to allow my attorneys to observe what your agents were doing? And why have you refused to tell me what you took from my home? Two points on this, right? One, he's writing a legal motion, which is obvious, and we're reading through it. But he's also writing, this is a campaign message, right? This is uh, bullet points that are easy to digest. And he's sort of encouraging Americans to put themselves in their in this position. And he's writing this as both a legal document and as a, a campaign promotional. So that we can all feel it. 
So he says, as set forth in detail below, the government has declined to provide even the most basic information about what was taken or why. However, the scant information the government has provided, a vaguely worded receipt for property in the warrant itself, raises significant Fourth Amendment questions about this unprecedented and unnecessary raid. For instance, the government has informed counsel for Trump that privileged and or privileged, potentially privileged documents were among the items that were seized. But the government has refused to provide in any information about the nature of those documents. Supreme Court has said that documents about communications between Trump and advisors are presumptively privileged, meaning we just sort of start from the position that they are protected. He doesn't have to prove and make a showing they're protected. They just are presumptively protected and privileged. Protecting the integrity of these documents is important not only to Trump, but also to the institution of the presidency. And this is an important point. We're going to take a look at the Clinton sock drawer case. But remember that until Trump, most Democrats sort of revered, well, actually that's not true. They only revered the presidency when their guy is in it. They thought that Bush was, you know, a Texas yokel. They think Trump is an orange Cheeto, right? They sort of mock the presidency until their person is in it. And then it's the most revered institution of all time. But in the Clinton sock drawer case, the judge in there said, look, you know, it is the, it is the president after all, all right? They're kind of like, the president. So they get ultimate discretion on things like presidential records. And to say otherwise is to diminish their office. So yeah, they might have a lot of fun here dunking on Trump saying that Trump doesn't deserve, you know, these same sort of uh, privileges. But that just diminishes their stature if the rules were to e be evenly applied to them. Of course, they try to finagle their way out of that. Trump's defense, they say, uh, judge, Significantly, the government has refused to provide Trump with any reason for the unprecedented general search of his home. To date, the government has failed to legitima legitimize its historic decision to raid the home of a president who had been fully cooperative. Instead, faced with public backlash, Attorney General has taken the unheard of step of announcing at a press conference that he was willing to release portions of a sealed search warrant application. Government leaks, many of which we covered here, to favored media outlets have provided ever-changing and inaccurate, quote, justifications for the politicized conduct of the FBI and the DOJ. These unsupported justifications by anonymous sources hint at a breakdown in communications between Trump's representatives and the government, or that there developed a need to obtain a search warrant. The actual chronology of events clearly establishes that there was no exigency for a forceful raid, and there is no basis for keeping the information about the raid from the public, right? What was the, what was the urgency? We talked about this. Was it like a scene out of Jack Bauer or Jack Reacher or you know, 24? Oh my gosh, somebody's going to come and run away with the codes, and they're going to enter it into their iPhone app, and it's going to nuke the moon or something. What was the exigency? What was the urgency? They've got to justify that. Why do we? Movement, therefore, requests the court order the government to provide the information sought by this motion to take other measures set forth under Trump's rights to protect his Fourth Amendment. And they say, Your Honor, let me provide you with a little bit of background here on why this is necessary. And remember, they're asking for the appointment of a special master, somebody to come in here and tell the FBI, stop rummaging through his stuff, return the stuff that's outside of the scope, give us an inventory of everything that's in there, and be reasonable individuals about this. Background. President Trump's voluntary assistance, they tell us, on January 20th, okay, that's the day that Trump left, Trump and his family left the White House. They moved back to their home, Mar-a-Lago, historic landmark there in Florida, beautiful place, mansion, 58 bedrooms, 33 bathrooms, 17 acres of land, extending from the Atlantic Ocean to the Intercoastal Waterway, hence the name Sea to Lake. Sounds nice. Consistent with every modern presidential transition, staff conducted the move on a condensed time frame. That move, like home moves undertaken by most Americans, involved the boxes. It was done during the day with boxes in full view. After Trump and his family settled back into their home, employees at the National Archives inquired as to whether any documents were inadvertently transferred by the movers to Mar-a-Lago. January 2022, this year, movement, that's Trump, voluntarily asked NARA movers to come to Mar-a-Lago to receive 15 boxes, 
okay, 15 NARA boxes that had been brought by movers to Mar-a-Lago so they could be transferred to NARA headquarters in D.C., right? Voluntarily, Trump says, I called you. On February 8th, NARA made the following public statement. They said the following. They said, uh, throughout the course of the last year, NARA obtained the cooperation of Trump representatives to locate presidential records that had not been transferred to National Archives at the end of the administration. When a representative informed NARA in December 21 that they had located some records, NARA arranged for them to be securely transported to Washington. NARA officials did not visit or raid the Mar-a-Lago property. Okay, so that's February. Meaning, sounds like they had like a peaceful transition of power of, doc of boxes there. And then they insurrected Trump's home. Uh, National Archives actually made that statement. Here's the archives.gov press release. Okay, in that release, they're saying, NARA obtained the cooperation of Trump, and they're saying, we cooperated freely. They came and got him. Sometime thereafter, NARA employees involved the White House and the DOJ in the matter of the voluntary return to boxes. National Archives says, we got our stuff, but we still need some help. So they called Uncle Joe and Aunt Merrick. Movement Trump was contacted because the 15 NARA boxes contained documents from his administration that were protected by executive privilege. And Trump's counsel communicated with representatives of the White House, the DOJ, NARA regarding these matters. Right. Trump says, I have legal entitlement to these things. My lawyers are in touch with your lawyers. They're mine. Here's why executive privilege, presidential records, whatever justification you want. On May 11th, Trump voluntarily italicized accepted service of a grand jury subpoena addressed to the custodian of records for the office of Trump, seeking documents bearing classification markings. Trump determined that a search for documents bearing those markings should be conducted even if the marked documents had been declassified and his staff conducted a diligent search of the boxes that had been moved from the White House to Florida. You asked us to look, we did. On June 2nd, Trump, through counsel, invited the FBI to come to Mar-a-Lago to retrieve the responsive documents. The next day on June 3rd, Jay Bratt, chief of the counterintelligence and export control over with the DOJ, actually came to Mar-a-Lago, accompanied by three FBI agents. Trump greeted them in the dining room, and there were two other attendees, the person designated as the custodian of records for the office of Trump and counsel for President Trump. Before leaving the group, President Trump's last words to Mr. Bratt and the FBI agents were as follows, quote, whatever you need, just let us know. Pops on in. Hey guys, good to see you. Whatever you need, let us know. Responsive documents were provided to the FBI agents. Mr. Bratt asked to inspect a storage room. Counsel for President Trump advised the group that Trump had authorized him to take the group to that room. If you need to see it, no problem. Come with me. The group proceeded to the storage room, escorted by two Secret Service agents. Storage room contained boxes, many containing the clothing and the personal items of President Trump and the First Lady. When their inspection was completed, the group left the area. Sounds very cooperative. Once back in the dining room, one of the FBI agents said, thank you. You did not need to show us a storage room, but we appreciate it. Now it all makes sense. Counsel for President Trump then closed the interaction and advised the government officials they should contact him with any further needs on the matter. Then a couple days later on June 8th, Mr. Bratt wrote to counsel for Trump. His letter requested in pertinent part that the storage room be secured. We talked about this, put the lock on there. In response, President Trump directed his staff to place a second lock on the door to the storage room and one was added. In the days that followed, Trump continued to assist the government. For instance, members of his personal and household staff were made available for voluntary interviews by the FBI. On June 22nd, government sent a subpoena to the custodian of records for the Trump Organization seeking footage from surveillance cameras at Mar-a-Lago. At Trump's direction, service of that subpoena was voluntarily accepted and responsive video footage was provided to the government. They're giving him everything. Then we get an application for a search warrant. They say, you know, despite the voluntary assistance provided by Trump, the government took the unprecedented step of requesting a search warrant for his home. The government sought an expansive and intrusive search of President Trump's office, all storage rooms, and, quote, 
all other rooms or areas with the premises used or available to be used by President Trump and his staff in which boxes or documents could be stored. Take a look at the search warrant. The government also sought an expansive definition of property that it could seize, which included not only responsive documents and associated boxes, but also, quote, any other containers or boxes that are collectively stored or found together with the aforementioned documents or containers. They say, essentially, the government secured authorization to seize boxes that just happen to be located near potentially responsive materials, okay? Anything that's like in the wingspan, the general vicinity, that's close enough. You get it. They continue. Section C, the unprecedented search of President Trump's home. Belying any actual urgency, the government waited three days until Monday, August 8th, 2022, to execute the search warrant. Early in the morning on August 8th, a group of roughly two dozen FBI agents gathered on the premises at Mar-a-Lago carrying boxes and other items. At 9.10 a.m., Mr. Bratt telephoned counsel for Trump and informed him that a group of FBI agents was at Mar-a-Lago to execute a search warrant. Heated discussion ensued as to why the government did not make a voluntary request to explore the premises, given the expansive assistance that Trump had provided up until this point. Mr. Bratt then made several requests. The first came by Mr. Bratt, made by Mr. Bratt, was that all CCTV cameras, closed circuit television, be turned off at Mar-a-Lago. Pursuant to Mar-a-Lago policy, and in the absence of any court order directing such a measure, uh, this request was declined. Mr. Bratt also requested the names of any attorneys who might arrive at Mar-a-Lago on behalf of Trump. In turn, counsel for Trump requested a copy of the search warrant and the affidavit in support of the warrant and asked to be provided with a list of anything seized once the search was over. Bratt declined to provide the search warrant and affidavit, stating that after the FBI agents finished their search, Trump would be provided a copy of the search warrant and a receipt for property, not the affidavit, right? And this is where there was a lot of fighting over this when this was all unfolding, saying that Trump's people were lying because they said they gave him the warrant and they said we didn't get the warrant. And we even made the point that they're probably sort of saying, you know, they're expecting the search warrant and affidavit to be the whole thing. Trump. So when they say we didn't get it, they mean we didn't get the whole thing. And they say you got part of it. You got enough. Now, among other actions, they write taken after being notified of this unprecedented event, counsel for Trump contacted three attorneys in the area who agreed to go to Mar-a-Lago. And once they arrived, they requested the ability to enter the mansion to order in order to observe what the FBI was actually doing there. The government declined that to occur. After approximately nine hours, the FBI concluded its search. An FBI agent provided one of the attorneys who had been waiting outside for nearly the full nine hours with a copy of the search warrant. FBI also provided a three-page receipt for the property. We've seen it. That list provided almost no information that would allow the reader to understand what was seized or the precise location of the items, because they were just box A, box A21, box A35, whatever. On August 11th, then a couple days after the raid, counsel for President Trump spoke with Mr. Bratt by telephone. The first item of discussion was a message from President Trump to Attorney General Garland. The message was as follows. They say, Bratt, who is counterintelligence, is speaking with Trump's lawyer. Trump is trying to communicate this message through Bratt to Attorney General Garland. He says, listen, Trump needs to communicate this. Okay, listen, Trump wants the attorney general to know that he has been hearing from people all over the country about the raid. And if there is one word to describe their mood, it is angry. Okay, the heat is building up. All right. The pressure is building up. And whatever I can do to take the heat down, to bring the pressure down, just let us know. Tells that over to Merrick Garland. We're trying to calm this down. In addition, counsel for Trump asked Mr. Bratt, one, can you provide a copy of the affidavit Two, Can you please appoint a special master to protect the integrity of the privileged documents? Can you provide a detailed list of exactly what was taken from Trump's home, not just generic boxes? I want to know what was taken and where it was taken from. And number four, I'd like to allow counsel for Trump the ability to take a look at what was seized. Let me come and take a look at what you're rummaging through there in your offices. 
Mr. Brat declined these four requests. Sorry, no, you don't get to do anything of that. No, uh, thanks for asking, though. To end the call, counsel for Trump requested that all on the call keep the line of communications open. All right, well, look, just talk to us. If you're going to indict him, if you're going to arrest him, just let us know. But just hours after the call, Attorney General Merrick Garland came out with a press conference. He came and said the following. Uh, just hours after the telephone call, Garland took the unusual step of holding a press conference to deliver remarks regarding the search of Mar-a-Lago and the government's motion to unseal the search warrant and receipt for property. Mr. Garland made no mention of Trump's clear and unequivocal message to him, right? Garland didn't say that his people talked to my people. In fact, the government made no response at all to Trump's invitation to help reduce public consternation with the government after the raid. Trump says, how can I help calm this down? They said, ignore it. Instead, Garland comes out afterwards and says, uh, just now the Justice Department has filed a motion in the Southern District of Florida to unseal the search warrant and the property receipt related to the FBI raid. The search was on the premises of Florida belonging to Trump. We didn't make any public statements that day, but Trump did. Copies of both the warrant and the property receipt were left there with the lawyer on site. Now they're saying they didn't get the affidavit and they didn't. The search warrant was authorized by a federal court upon the required finding of probable cause, blah, blah, blah. Then he said about the issuance and the execution of the warrant, he says, first, I personally approve the decision to seek a search warrant in this matter. And second, the department does not take such a decision lightly. Where possible, it is standard practice to seek less intrusive means as an alternative to a search and to narrowly scope any search that is undertaken. Right? We're not going to just go raid presidents willy-nilly. Then he says, the public statement, this is Trump's team, he says, this public statement is deeply troubling given that President Trump is the clear front runner in the 2024 Republican presidential primary and the 2024 presidential election, should he decide to run. The statement clearly suggests that the decision to raid Mar-a-Lago a mere 90 days before the 2022 midterms involved political calculations aimed at diminishing the leading voice in the Republican Party, President Trump. All facts laid out herein show that there was complete cooperation between Trump, his team, and the appropriate agencies, and Mr. Garland's remarks stray from longstanding DOJ policy, footnote number five. If you doubt me, they say, just go over here to the Justice Manual, section 1-7.400, and you can look it up. It says, the DOJ generally will not confirm the existence or otherwise comment about ongoing investigations. Oh, well, they commented on it. So they broke their tradition, didn't they? The decision by the attorney general to conduct a hastily prepared press conference to announce his intention to release the search warrant was an ill-founded reaction to the public outcry that followed the raid on Trump's home. See, so they're skewering him for releasing the information. As they're saying, you should release the information because all of this is unprecedented, right? They're, and they're right to, to do this. The DOJ is breaking precedent everywhere they turn. Every time they're, they're, they, everything they step on is breaking. So Trump's defense makes the following argument. They say, Judge, here's why you should appoint a special master. Number one, the extraordinarily unusual conduct of the DOJ, it raises fundamental Fourth Amendment concerns, obviously. The Fourth Amendment to the Constitution says as follows, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, and other things, and no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause, talking about particularity, the place to be searched, and the person or things to be seized. Very important amendment. Now, prior to any indictment and the availability of available various grounds of suppression from evidence, the mechanism that provides grounds for relief is Rule 41G. The rule says that we have to protect the rights of citizens who have been aggrieved by unlawful searches and seizures of property. And even as the government is dug in against transparency in this case, fighting the release of the affidavit and claiming a redacted version would be worthless due to the need to hide the actual substance, there are significant red flags that implicate Trump's Fourth Amendment rights and cry out for judicial intervention by way of a special master monitoring and discovery assistance. Wow. I agree. They say the warrant is facially overbroad on one example. Permitting agents to seize entire boxes of documents merely because they are physically found together 
is clearly overbroad. And they cite a 11th Circuit case. They say searches deemed necessary should be as limited as possible and that limiting searches is very important. They say boxes of personal documents, things like photographs, items like clothing, these are not contraband. They may not be lawfully seized. You don't get Melania's blouses, special agents. Is that plural for blouses? In fact, the search warrant's broad scope was in violation of the Fourth Amendment's particularity requirement, and thus the warrant permitted a general search. That's prohibited. Unconstitutional, since the red-coated soldiers created the need for the requirement in the first place. Similarly, they say the government sought to improperly evade limitations on enforcing the Presidential Records Act. Right? And we've talked about this. This is the Clinton sock drawer case. Clinton had recorded interviews with a biographer. He took those with him, and then something happened. No, nobody knows what happened to him. Judicial Watch sued the National Archives and said, you let him get away with presidential records. The judge in that case came out and said, those are his records. We defer to the president. They're personal if he says they're personal. But now they're saying that's not the same standard that applies to Trump. Here, the investigation regarding Trump's return of the NARA boxes involved a NARA referral to the DOJ based on questions relating to the documents falling within control of the Presidential Records Act. But the PRA accords the president virtually complete control over his records during his term in office. And there is no criminal enforcement mechanism or penalty in the PRA because how are you going to penalize the president? Did the DOJ's National Security Division, NSD, recognize that deficiency and then decide to recategorize this case on that basis simply to manufacture a basis to seek a search warrant? And more importantly, did the NSD and the FBI mischaracterize the types of documents that it sought to seize to avoid the lack of enforcement mechanism? Right. So what they're saying is these people are making their claims that this raid was justified under the PRA. But if you read the PRA, it doesn't say uh, you get to go do search warrant raids to go get documents back. Right. It's not in there. Like in DUI law, right, if you don't give consent to have a blood sample drawn from your body, most states like Arizona and others have something called implied consent. There is a law saying there are penalties if you don't do something and they have the right to get a warrant and take it from you anyways. It's all codified. So they say, that, well, you have to give us that blood or we have the right to take it. Here's why. The Presidential Records Act doesn't say, yeah, you can go get the, the, the overdue library books from the president and you can raid his home if you want to. It's not in there. The government's reckless pursuit of a search warrant implicates well-established basis for suppression under the Fourth Amendment law. They tell us under controlling Supreme Court precedent, a search warrant violates a person's Fourth Amendment rights if there are material misstatements or material omissions in the affidavit. They write, did the DOJ mischaracterize or omit from its affidavit the true extent of Trump's cooperation? Did they say that Trump was not cooperating when we have got this big laundry list of he sent this letter, his counsel said this letter, FBI came in, he came over there, gave him the old fist bumperoo, said, whatever you guys need, you got it, you let us know. Did the FBI agent put that in his search warrant affidavit when he was submitting that to the judge, yes or no? Press reports by anonymous government sources raise this question, they write. <clears throat> Trump's lawyers also ask the judge, they say, judge, in addition, did the special agent who drafted the warrant, did they fairly disclose any pretextual or dual purpose at work for this warrant? Like, for example, did they want to go get my letters from Kim Jong-il, but then did they want to go see if I had any uh, January 6th stuff in there? Maybe. For example, the receipt of property largely fails to identify the seized documents with any particularity, but it does refer to a seizure of an item labeled executive grant of clemency about Roger Jason Stone. So why would they take that? Aside from demonstrating that this was an unlawful general search, it also suggests that the DOJ simply wanted the camel's nose under the tent so they could rummage for either politically helpful documents or support other efforts to thwart Trump from running again like the January 6th investigation, there it is. Interestingly, in the government's response to the motions to unseal the affidavit, the government claims public exposure to the affidavit will, quote, jeopardize this investigation and, quote, other high-profile investigations. 
which we mocked last week saying, oh, all of the other presidents that they're raiding their homes? Yeah, all of the other parallel Mar-a-Lago raids? Yeah, no. The phrasing suggests the DOJ has other interests at work than simply collecting documents with classified markings. They say, you know, finally, the elements of national security statutes like those referenced by the search warrant and other things about administrative rules about classification and declassification, they say, these are complex matters. Did the FBI special agent, when they were drafting up this search warrant request, did they fully disclose the strictures of those statutes and Trump's authority to declassify those documents? Like, did they make the pitch? Did they say judge? Trump has the right to declassify like virtually everything, but not these. Here's why. Here's how we overcome that. So are they arguing for that at all? Or did they just say his library books are overdue, judge? See, let's go get them. Did the affiant, the, the FBI agents, did they disclose that there are public statements by those with knowledge indicating the documents searched had already been declassified? This could establish that there were violations to Trump's Fourth Amendment rights. That's why we got to see the documents, they say. And they continue, they say, look, Your Honor, the, the court knows the government has long treated Trump unfairly. DOJ and the FBI have demonstrated a willingness to treat Trump differently than any other citizen. Two years of noisy, quote, Russia collusion. And those investigations led to special counsel finding that biased FBI agents and officials exist. Stories of FBI agents engaging in information laundering, where a fired informant continued to feed the FBI false information through a DOJ official to investigate Trump. And even an FBI general counsel lawyer falsifying documents to support a FISA warrant and penetration into Trump's inner circle back during the campaign. An assistant director at the FBI was referred to prosecution for lying repeatedly about the Trump probe and text message exchanges between the lead agent Peter Strzok and Lisa Page, the FBI lovers, reflect their complete disdain and bias against President Trump and his supporters. All the while they were entrusted with probing the farcical Russian collusion hoax. Trump's defense says, look, without any further information from the government, Trump currently has no ability to assess whether any FBI agents involved in the Russia defamation matter are participating here with the NSD in the current situation. Historically, courts tend to give significant deference to law enforcement reps who weigh in against non-disclosure of sensitive materials because of the investigative needs. But Trump's team says, in light of the recent FBI behavior, when Trump is a part of its aim, this court should feel obliged to demand candor and transparency and not just, quote, trust us assertions from the DOJ. The appointment of a special master with a fair minded approach to providing defense counsel with information needed to support any Rule 41G filing is an appropriate use of this court's authority. And this court should appoint a special master under B to protect Trump's constitutional rights. Federal rules of civil procedure talk about this court's ability to fashion equitable remedies, to balance the playing field, so to speak. The government has requested in cases involving seizure, similar things in other cases, and therefore we should be able to request the same thing. They say the receipt for property that we got out of the government is so vague and lacking in any specificity that the reader does not even know what was seized from Trump's house. Seized documents reflecting presidential communications with advisors are presumptively privileged. All things starting at zero, we start with their privilege because they're presidential communications with advisors. The documents seized on August 8th were seized from Trump. They were created during his term as president, right, back then. Accordingly, they are presumptively privileged until proven otherwise. That's a U.S. Supreme Court case called Nixon. Only an evaluation by a neutral reviewer, somebody who is, in fact, a special master, can secure the sanctity of these privileged materials. As a general matter, says Trump's team, the likelihood that the government seized privileged materials suggests the need for a careful review process. For example, while there has never been a search warrant executed at the home of a president, federal regulations acknowledge the delicate nature of reviewing ma privileged material. Different officers need to be 
involved to make sure that we take the utmost care with privileged materials. This investigation undoubtedly involves the same type of materials. During the Clinton presidency, this issue of privilege, specifically the presumption of privilege, was raised in response to a grand jury subpoena directed to the White House counsel. While the context differs from the president, president's case, the court's analysis of the nature of the evidence sought by the grand jury applies with equal strength here. In that case, the court Adhere to the Supreme Court ruling. They say when a president of the United States asserts a claim of executive privilege, the district court has a duty to treat the subpoenaed material as presumptively privileged. All things starting at zero, we just say, look, if the president claims it, it he, he is the president after all. We're just going to say it's presumptively privileged just because they claimed it. Furthermore, if at the time of the documents or at the time the materials were created, they reflect presidential decision-making and deliberations, they are also presumptively privileged. Why might that be? Because it's decision-making, it's deliberations, right? It's sort of a product of the president's mind and the, president and the president's advisor's minds. Sort of like attorney-client privilege. Why does that exist? To protect that relationship. This is a strong presumption and not merely lip service, they say, from a DC circuit case. With the conclusion that the materials seized from Trump are all presumptively privileged, it is unreasonable to allow the prosecution and their team to review these documents without meaningful safeguards. There's precedent. It's presumptively privileged. We protect those privileges. It's not lip service. Short of returning the seized items back over to Trump, only a neutral review by a special master can protect the public interest and also protect the confidentiality of the conversations. Balancing the two sides. Yes, we know that you've got an interest in prosecuting criminals, but we also have an interest from the defense perspective of making sure that the documents are not problematic. The DOJ filter team will not protect Trump's rights. They say the government has told uh, Trump that they're using a filter team over with the department. Of, don't worry about this. Yeah, we know that there's privilege protected information in there, but don't worry about it. We have a filter team on there. In certain instances, a filter protocol can serve as an important role where they seize documents. But as the Justice Manual notes, they can be used for limited reviews. Here, however, it's a little bit more than that. The implementation of the filter protocol was procedurally deficient. They say that there were some problems with how they implemented it. They also say the magistrate judge approved the filter protocol without any input from the defense. So there's sort of a due process problem here, right? Judge says, oh, filter team, no problem. Filter team's perfect. What are you guys going to do? What's your plan? Sounds good to me. Versus saying to the defense, how do you feel about that? Since you're the person whose rights are going to be implicated. The defense makes that point. They say the result is a protocol that is plainly ineffective. It does not ensure that the prosecution team members will not access or become aware of the materials as the filter team prosecutes. And uh, in other words, how do you ensure that the filter team actually filters? Fundamental fairness requires, says Trump, a special master. The court is considering analogous issues and considering those types of matters previously have appointed special masters before. You've done it in other cases. You should do it here. In particular, this court and others have assessed the use of special masters when we're talking about things about privilege. And they cite some other cases here, referencing the, the cases where those came from. Case called Stewart. They say, as a general matter, a taint team is insufficient. The matter has captured the attention of the American public. Merely adequate safeguards are not acceptable when the matter at hand involves not only constitutional rights of Trump, but also the preservation of executive privilege. Trump submits that the appointment of a special master is the only appropriate action for it to have any meeting at all, and the U.S. should cease its review of seized materials. They want an inventory. You see here federal rules of criminal procedure saying they want a more detailed inventory. The receipt for property doesn't do anything other than detail that it's secret, top secret, or confidential. They say this level of detail does not meet the standard of verification under the rules. They say an inventory of the property is ministerial. However, it's a matter of fundamental fairness that the agents at least identify 
from what location the boxes came from, where the boxes were, whether the boxes were at the location or whether the agents brought the locations, brought the, brought the boxes to the locations with them, whether the confidential labels were used or how they labeled the documents and the boxes. Therefore, they say the property receipt is legally deficient and we need more than that. This, along with the inspection of the full affidavit, is the only way to ensure that President Trump can properly evaluate and avail himself of the rules. Therefore, for the foregoing reasons, we ask, one, a special master be appointed, seize materials be returned, more detailed property receipts, and a review of everything that was in fact seized, signed off on by Lindsey Halligan and James Trustee. And that is the massive, massive monster motion that Trump said was coming. It hits the court dockets on April 22nd. And we've got several pending issues to continue to, to uh, contend with. We saw that the issue of particularity actually did come into play. Trump and his team were saying that, you know what? They said that they were just searching for things like this, right? This is a screenshot directly from the warrant itself. They said that they were looking for any government or presidential records created between January 20th and January, uh, January 20, 2017 and January 20, 2021, okay? The entire presidency, they want materials on. And uh, I mean, beyond that, right? It's not just the presidency. It's basically Trump's entire uh, tenure, even before he was president. No, after he was president. The entire presidency, every single stinking document, they want it. And Trump's lawyers, as we know, they were also hinting about this. They said that they were going to be filing a motion. Here is one of Trump's lawyers was apparently on the Mark Levin show and Fox News got a clip. Here is what he was talking about. The Fourth Amendment requires particularity. It requires narrowness to the intrusion on the person's home. And this warrant had language in it. And keep in mind, all we've seen is a warrant and an inventory. But the warrant has language in it about if you find a classified document, you can take the whole box around it and you can take any boxes near it. Mm -hmm. And that's really the, the functional equivalent of a general search. There's just no limit to that kind of scope in the warrant. We're going to come out swinging and say, look, you know, this cannot be something where we just get a, uh, a kind of a wink and a nod from DOJ that we're supposed to trust them under these circumstances. We're going to have to get court involved, judicial interventions at the district court level to get somebody in the mix here that can help us uh, vindicate the Fourth Amendment rights of the president. Yeah, and that's exactly what we saw, right? That's exactly what they filed. And that, that document hit the court docket you know, today. And I wanted to show you very briefly the case that came out from this judge, Judge Amy Berman. We read some of this last week, but this was important. And I highlighted a couple uh, excerpts from this case. This is the Clinton sock drawer case. This is where Clinton took records and they said, oh, you really can't do anything about it. Here is one snippet from Judge Berman, in her opinion, and we covered sort of some of this opinion, but it's a very powerful opinion, because here's what it says. She writes, thus, the Presidential Records Act requires the president to maintain records, okay, this is all relevant to Clinton, of his administration, but, but, leaves the implementation of such a requirement in the president's hands, citing U.S. Code 2203A, 44 U.S. Code. So if you take a look at that, she writes the following, okay? She says, practically speaking, what are you going to do about this? What standard of review would apply? She cites footnote four. And she says, would there not be a high level of deference accorded to a president's decision about which records are personal? Like, don't we just leave it up to the president to decide? Because they are, after all, the president and in this case, right, this, this you know, judge is probably fawning over Clinton or whatever. Oh, you know, he's a president. He gets to decide. And then she says, how could a challenge to a president's classification decision be litigated without the decision maker participating as a party to the lawsuit? If a classification decision is reviewable, like if the president says these are personal records and you say they're not, uh, who reviews that? And what statute of limitations applies? Okay, when does it expire? Would that period have expired in this case, given that President Clinton has been out of office for 12 years? 
Like, can you get to litigate this forever? Statute of limitations means that you're, you're out of time. Like there's nothing else to, you can't bring a claim now because the, the, it's too much time has elapsed. Like if you're in a car accident, you are, you know, you can't bring a lawsuit 10 years after the car accident. You've got to bring it soon because you're going to heal and they need evidence that's relevant. That's close in time to the violation or to the accident. So here, okay. They say, what, what are we going to do about this? Bearing in mind the Armstrong decisions and other, they say that she writes, the court has seriously doubts. The court has seriously doubts about whether the former president's retention of the audio tapes as a personal matter is a matter that is subject to judicial review. What does that mean? The courts can't even look at it. So they can complain to us, but what are we supposed to do as a court? If the court says to Clinton, you mislabeled your documents. I'm a judge. I'm telling you, Mr. President, that uh, it's not a presidential record. It's this other thing. And you're in trouble now because I'm a district judge and I said so. It's ridiculous, right? She's saying here that exactly. I can't even, I have doubt whether I can even judicially review any of this at all. But now in this case, suddenly uh, Donald Trump is uh, perfectly legitimately prosecuted right? Everybody's suddenly forgetting about the Clinton sock drawer case, turning this into, you know, the crime of the century where other presidents got a lot of deference. Now, there are Trump lawyers who are out there explaining that a lot of Americans are identifying these massive double standards and taking issue with them. This is Christina Bob. This is the lawyer for Trump who was there on scene as the FBI was raiding his property. And she came out and she's sort of hinting that a lot of upset people are going to have opinions about this in the foreseeable future. And a lot of, you know, sort of lefties were on Twitter over the weekend saying she is threatening violence. She is prognosticating that if Trump doesn't get his way, that this is all going to come crashing down because of Trump, right? Almost threatening the DOJ. And as I've said before, they're going to try to do this for Trump. Every time he makes a defense or files a motion, they're going to say that he's undermining democracy, right? If he goes in there and he says, yeah, the FBI is corrupt, just like any defendant would do in any case, any criminal defendant in any part of this country, when you're charged with a crime, you say, cops are liars, cops uh, falsified evidence, not mine, somebody else's, right? It's all casting doubt on the prosecutorial process. It's part of the law. It's part of the adversarial system. You don't want a system where defense attorneys just say, great job there, prosecutor. Well done. Wow, what, amazing. Oh, this uh, police file looks perfect. Well, okay, well, uh, you got him. Nice job. See you on the next one, right? That's not how this works. But if Donald Trump comes out and he castigates the FBI, they're going to say that he's undermining uh, democratic values. Here's Christina Bob talking about this with Newsmax. I don't see an indictment coming down. I also think the the nation's reaction to this raid, I think the department was surprised at how angry America got and how frustrated we all are that we feel like we're losing our rights. And um, this is so overly political. So I think it's causing them to go, oh, you know, maybe we don't have what we think what we think we have. So I hope that they take a second look and are cautious about doing something as stupid as trying to go after President Trump. Well, because yeah, especially they've tried this before. That's the sentence, right? That's the sentence. I hope they do something and think about this before they go after President Trump. And you ask yourself, uh, is that an unreasonable thing to say? We've all been asking that they think about this before they jump into it. Because if this really is a situation where Hall Monitor Merrick Garland and librarian Na National Archives are upset that Donald Trump had some overdue library books from uh, Barack Obama, a letter to him when the transition took place, right? Presidents write letters. Apparently, one of the letters was Obama wrote Trump a letter. Got to get that back. And Kim Jong-il or Un or whatever wrote Trump a letter. Got to get that back. If this is overdue library books and they invaded and raided his home, yeah, a lot of people are going to have some problems with that. Here is Trump lawyer Lindsey Halligan, who actually filed and submitted the motion that we just read through earlier today. Here she is talking about some of the problems with the FBI and how they might have interfered with the chain of custody, right? You want to have a very clean chain of custody. Person A gives it to person B and nothing happens in that handoff. But what happens if person A gives it to B, B gives it to C, C gives it to D, D gives it to E, and in there, you've got a rogue Peter Strzok or you've got a rogue Lisa Page lying around 
who are sitting in there trying to say, we're going to take care of him. We'll stop him. Trump's not going to succeed as long as we're here. Well, then they might corrupt that chain of custody, which is exactly what Lindsey Halligan is implying here, which is a perfectly legitimate defense theory. I have books written with chapters on this stuff. For some reason, they demanded the security cameras be switched off. Uh, are these reports true that it was um, rather an unpleasant experience for you and your colleagues and the staff at Mar-a-Lago? Well, I arrived after uh, they already started searching. So I think they started searching around 10 a.m. And I didn't arrive until about 11, 11.30. Um, so I wasn't there for any sort of scuffle that happened before. I can't talk. I can't speak to that. But when I arrived, I asked if I could go inside the property and they told me no. And I asked why not. And they said, you can come in when we're done. And I asked if I could stand in an area of the building um, that they're not searching. And they said no. Uh, so they had unfettered access to the property and did God knows what and looked at God knows what. So they could have done whatever they wanted. Did they give you any reason, any justification why the security cameras would have to be switched off, Lindsay? No, they didn't ask that to me specifically, um, but I, I am assuming that um, their argument would uh, have something to do with protecting um, protecting the identity of the agents. I'm not sure. All right, so more info there. And of course, they're going to be attacking that chain of custody, rightfully so, something you would do in any criminal case. In fact, it's a huge part of almost every criminal case is checking the ch chain of custody, in particular in DUIs. Now, here is a quick update on the Trump search warrant docket. We can see the latest filing came in and there's not a whole lot of new activity here today. So yeah, the other docket that we reviewed where Trump is actually filing a complaint demanding a special master has some more there. This is the actual search warrant docket. Here you can see a couple things were unsealed, but I checked these earlier and these are not anything interesting. These are the orders to seal essentially and the motions to seal. We've already covered those. So uh, not much new here. Docket entry 84. Michael Barth, we read through some of his stuff last week. He filed an appeal, notice of an appeal, paid the appeal fee. He wants access and he wants to be allowed to intervene. Remember, several people were denied the ability to intervene and they're now appealing that. So clerk transmitted the notice of appeal and those will all go up on appeal and uh, we'll continue to watch this as it unfolds. But that is the latest on Donald Trump.